as it applies to with diverse learning needs. Let's go to the next slide. Great, thank you. And so to do our work together here today, we have a few um, values and norms that we'd like to um, embrace together. Take a moment and read um, the norms, uh, um, excuse me, our values in yellow. And if you could, in the chat, um, write one or two that particularly resonates with you and that you'd like to keep front of mind today. I see lots of joy and humor coming through. Really glad to see that. Um, we're going to do a lot of uh, thinking and work today. So I'm glad you know we um, join each other with some joy and humor in this session. We also have um, several virtual norms. We ask that as much as you can, please be on video, um, especially when you go into breakout rooms, when you're going to be chatting with your colleagues. Um, if you're unable to go on uh, to go on video, that's okay. Just engage um, in the best way that you can that works for you. Um, we also ask that when we're in the large session to please stay on mute. Um, and if you have questions to private chat Tabitha Heyman, who's also from TNTP, she will be much quicker to answer any need or question that you have than Thelma or I while we're facilitating. And also, if you need to step away for um, any reason, please try um, to not do so during the breakouts because that's really our chance to discuss our thinking and learning um, and apply it with one another. And then we have a few icons there. When you see the orange um, icon, that means that uh, we'd like you to refer to your handout or note catcher. And for today, uh, a PDF copy of today's deck is actually embedded into the note catcher along with a few video links that we're gonna look at today. And then also when we see the speaking bubble icon, it means we're gonna go out, go into a breakout discussion. Next slide. Great. So I'm gonna turn it over to my um, colleague, Margaret, to share a little bit more about TNTP and our relationship with the Commonwealth. Thanks, Irene. Thanks everyone for being here today. As Irene said, I just wanna give a little bit more background and context as to our partnership with DESI. So first, a bit about TNTP in case you're not familiar with our organization. We were founded in 1997 by teachers who believe that all students deserve great teaching with a particular focus on equity for students who've been historically underserved by school systems. Today, our work focuses on three primary areas, which you can see indicated here on this slide, rigorous academics, talented people, and supportive environments. And we also offer a range of support from strategic advice to multi-year plans with school districts, charter networks, and state departments of education, which brings us to our work with the roadmap and here today. TNTP and DESI have actually partnered on several initiatives previously, including teacher diversification and deeper learning. Although this year will not be typical in many ways, uh, we're not completely reinventing the wheel. The learning acceleration approach will support bringing all of our students into grade level instruction and supporting their well being. But many of the items that we'll discuss here today will be uh, practices that you already do things that you might have seen done, or things that you have been meaning to try, but perhaps haven't yet prioritized yet. So this roadmap actually exists in two forms, which you can see here on the slide, um, and a classroom educator edition and a school leader edition. And it's designed to provide a focused and phased approach to supporting students in the 21-22 school year, a year that will lay the foundation for accelerated learning over the next few years. And in planning and developing these roadmaps, we connected with educators, school and district leaders, students, community members, and all different stakeholders across the state of Massachusetts. The insights and perspectives that these stakeholders shared were essential to developing these roadmaps, as well as the learning experiences that we're offering this summer, like here today. DESI and TNTP closely collaborated to ensure that these roadmaps were aligned with the unique needs of students across the Commonwealth and 
we were sure to incorporate the existing tools and resources that are currently provided by DESI. If you attended or watched the recording of the webinar um, introducing the roadmap itself, then you likely remember that the roadmap is organized around three overarching priorities, which are grounded in research that we know will support learning acceleration for students and were developed through extensive stakeholder feedback, as I previously mentioned. The guidance around each priority is designed to create equitable experiences and outcomes for all of your students in a manner that's affirming of their race, identity, home language, and their unique abilities. You've likely heard that accelerated learning is largely or primarily about intentionally planning for just-in-time instruction or scaffolds. This is true, and we would like to add that throughout this series, when we use the phrase, an accelerated learning approach, it's meant to acknowledge the importance of attending to each of these three priorities in order to effectively accelerate learning. In other words, to do accelerated learning well, educators must have strong and responsive relationships, know their students well, and use what they know to plan with intention. Thanks, Margaret. So right now, what we'd like for you to do is to take a moment to read our objectives for today's session. And um, while you're reading those, I'm going to ask Tabitha to read chat a link to our note catcher. Again, in the note catcher, you can see uh, a link to this deck, um, as well as uh, links to the videos we're going to be looking at today. Uh, I recommend having that open uh, while we're going through the session. So to get us to our learning objectives for today, we have these three guiding questions for our learning. And we're gonna start out with this first one around why are we accelerating rather than remediating student learning in the first place, especially when it comes to students with disabilities and English learners. So we're gonna do a quick recap of how we're using these two terms, remediation and acceleration. If you've joined us for our previous um, sessions, we've talked a bit about this already, but we're gonna do, um, we're gonna look at another graphic to really get our heads around this idea. So in the graphic you see on the slide, you see figures A, B, and C. A, B, and C represent knowledge, standards, skills, and practices from the prior um, grade levels. So what you see is that with uh, traditional remediation, we see that um, it's usually a focus on the mastery of previous year's concepts taught in blocks or in mass. And then usually it's not until later in the year where we transition to grade level content. So this kind of instruction often has students constantly looking back and focusing on content that's no longer applicable to grade level concepts. And this form of instruction, it follows a concept that implies that new learning cannot happen until old learning is mastered. And while this may intuitively feel right, or even reminiscent of how maybe um, we crammed in high school or college days, uh, cognitive researchers have helped to illuminate that there is, a, there is fallacy in this thinking. So while these types of learning practices may lead to short-term results, um, they don't lead to the long-term sustained learning that we know students need. So therefore, it is an ineffective learning strategy. Let's look at how accelerated learning contrasts with this approach. So in contrast, acceleration focuses on strategically building knowledge at specific moments in time so that students can assess grade level content. So what you see here is rather than engage in remediating strategies, educators rely on concepts similar to just-in-time instruction that takes unfamiliar concepts that may or may not have been taught in a previous grade level or concepts from a previous grade level, and they use them to scaffold students into grade level learning. So educators review the current grade level content represented here by uh, the letter D, and they identify the content from prior grades that students must understand to access that grade level content. 
And so in the um, illustration you see on your slide, this educator has identified that some aspects of A prior grade level content and C prior grade, grade level content are critical for the current grade level. But in the case of B uh, prior grade content, it's not at all necessary for the students this year. Moreover, the teacher realizes that while important, not all of A content and not all of C content is critical. Even here, the educator has been selective and identified specifically what about A and what about C standards and skills from prior grades is critical. Finally, uh, acceleration-minded educators, they recognize that learning within context is critical. So while the educator recognizes that A and C are important grade concepts, the teacher is not blocking out those concepts in mass at the beginning of the school year or the beginning of the semester. Instead, they're choosing proximity uh, and only highlighting these prior year concepts when they are the most applicable to the current or most immediate grade level content. So now you may be wondering who this approach is uh, well suited for. And simply stated, uh, accelerated learning is an appropriate approach to learning for all students, including English learners and students with learning and thinking differences. And TNTP recently completed a study that provides new and compelling evidence that learning acceleration is particularly effective for students who are struggling and significantly uh, behind their peers. So let's take a quick look at that study and the findings. Next slide. So in our newest research paper released in partnership with Zern, we focus specifically on elementary math and we focus on the efficacy of these two approaches and what we can uncover about how to most efficiently and equitably support unfinished learning uh, for all kids. And in the study, which you can find on our website, we found that students who are academically behind their peers benefit tremendously from accelerating learning practices as a way of accessing grade level work. What we found also affirmed our findings from our other study, the opportunity myth, around which students do and do not receive the opportunity to succeed on grade level work. So we found that students in high poverty schools with majority Black, Latinx, American Indian student populations are significantly more likely to be remediated than their white and wealthier counterparts, even when their level of struggle is identical. So just to reinforce that, again, students in lower income and non-white majority classrooms are more likely to be heavily remediated than their white high income counterparts, despite similar levels of readiness. With that said, when students who traditionally receive remediation were provided with accelerated learning approaches, they actually mastered nearly 50% more grade level lessons um, than students who were in remediated classrooms. We also found that students who experienced learning acceleration practices, they struggled less and again learned more than students who started at the same level, but experienced remediation practices instead. And part of the reason for this is what we looked at before, that with just-in-time instruction, students are receiving instruction that's tailored to only address what is necessary to master the grade level content that's being focused on in that moment. So in other words, their learning is contextualized and instructional time is used efficiently and intentionally. So while we know that this approach works, we also know that oftentimes, despite the best of intentions, planning for scaffolding and differentiation for our students with diverse learning needs can unfortunately feel like an additional layer or additional task that sometimes we run out of time for. And it may feel more efficient to, um, as you may have heard this phrase, to teach down the middle. So right now, I'd like for us to spend some time confronting this belief and its implications on student learning for a high percentage of students. 
And before this, I do want to make um, a disclaimer to acknowledge that not all educators think this way. If you are an educator who um, does not hold this belief, I encourage you to think about the language and discussion we're having today as a way of motivating and influencing your colleagues who may still continue to hold this belief. So a common mindset that students with um, learning and thinking differences uh, are impacted by is this idea of the mythical average student to whom we aim our practices at. So in other words, it's the idea that what works for them should work for all or most. However, as I just shared, and we have seen, uh, by not attending to students with diverse learning needs, we're creating barriers to learning and thus privileging already advantaged groups of students um, at the expense of their peers. So uh, the person you see on your screen is Shelley Moore, a Canadian researcher and educator who's devoted her work to focusing on increasing inclusivity for children in education. And we're going to watch a quick video from her where she uses the analogy of bowling to connect to this idea of the mythical average student and why it's so problematic. So as you listen to the video, I'd like for you to consider the questions on the slide, which you will then discuss in a little uh, while after viewing the video. So we're asking, how do the ideas expressed in this video challenge or expand the way you see education? And also to reflect on your own instructional practices and think about how do you ensure that you're holding high transparent expectations for all students. So after we watch the video, we'll take a few moments for you to stop and jot down some notes in preparation for um, our discussion group. But for right now, uh, we're going to actually chat you the link to the video, which can also be found in your note catcher. And we ask that you uh, watch the video on your own and we will come back at um let's say 325 uh to regroup so please take this time to now watch the video and feel free to go off camera as you're watching so I can see from the chat that um, we are about done watching the video and I'm glad um, that you enjoyed it. Again, uh, we think this is an excellent video to share with your colleagues who may um, hold this belief and we'll take some time to also discuss it more um, today in small groups. But first, um, let's unpack a little bit more here. So let's stay with Shelley's analogy of the two pins standing. And think of these pins, of course, as our students. And we're gonna reduce that two out of 10 down to one out of five. And we're gonna pull that student from the margins into front focus. And this brings us to a visual that represents the bedrock research for this work. Uh, the National Center for Learning Disabilities found that one in five people actually learn and think differently. And before we unpack more about what that means, I want to make a clear distinction. Uh, so sure, it would be fair to say that we are all different when it comes to how we think and learn. But research shows that one in five people are so different in terms of how they process information that their lives are uniquely more challenging as they try to navigate, compensate, and succeed in a world that's been designed for the four and five. So as you see on your side, when we say learning and thinking differences, that encompasses um, those with diagnosed and undiagnosed um, disabilities. So in a sense, we're also just talking about natural learner variability, not just uh, disabilities. And thinking about the number of students in your school, or let's say your classroom, think about how many students might this equal for you. And then furthermore, on top of that, one in every 10 students is an English learner. And of course, learning another language is not a form of uh, learning difference or disability so much as that it is a different learning need that students have. We also know that in just a couple of years, one in four students will be identified or classified as an English learner. And of those students, um, albeit 
perhaps overrepresented, 40% of English learners are also students with diagnosed learning disabilities. So we'd like for you to pause and consider how the quote unquote average student you may typically envision may be shifting or needs to shift. So we know that how we approach uh, learning acceleration matters. And this is why in a moment, we're going to dive into looking how to use the, how the use of appropriate scaffolds can support learning acceleration. But before we do that, we'd like for you to have a moment um, to reflect with your colleagues on the learning we've done so far, um, as well as your own instructional practices when it comes to holding high expectations and supporting the development of students' academic skills and identities as learners. So we're going to go into breakouts for about the next five or so uh, minutes, and then we'll come back together to share out some of our um, major takeaways. And we'll chat these questions so you'll have them. And again, they're also in your um, copy of the slide deck. Great, I think we're all back in the room. Um, just one uh, norm we forgot to mention at the top of the session. If you could wait for the timer to bring you back, that way we come back all together at once, uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. So we have some time now and we'd uh, to share out on what some of those reflections were that you shared with your group. So if you'd like to share, uh, please put your name in the chat and we'd love for you to come off of mute to hear um, some of your reflections and thinking that you shared with your group. Jen, thanks for kicking us off. Could you come off mute, please? Sure. Um, I was just commenting in the group that I've been teaching for many years, and um, I usually have a really good idea about what students basically know when they come in, even though there's some outliers. So this year, um, I'm feeling extremely challenged, but happy to be part of these webinars to get thinking because I, I'm not really sure. I don't have like a really solid grasp on what they're going to come in with and what they're not. Um, so I'm, I'm really focused on trying to find the quickest way um, to, to do that and the most effective way. Thanks for that, Jen. And I'm going to put in a little plug for our session later this week about diagnosing unfinished learning. Um, there's been some questions already in the chat about how do you determine who those um, students and pins are that need the most support. Um, as we always say, it's a lot about getting to know your students in multiple different ways, um, but we will be going over diagnosing unfinished learning uh, tomorrow. And um, I saw a few more names. I'm sorry, my chat seems to be freezing. I think I saw there was a Sharon um, who put her name yep, in. That's okay. me. Um, we were talking about um, a couple of things. First of all, um, some of the scaffolding you can sort of plan because you know, like if you have English learners or students on the IEP, so you're familiar with what they need. Um, but um, a lot of the scaffolding um, is just in time because you don't know, and it could be any student, you know, students that you don't know. And then the other thing, you know, that we were talking about was, you know, the bowling analogy you know, it, it, you do the first time and then you have scaffolding, but understanding that the second time might, you know, the, the scaffold might not work. And sometimes it's hard to identify um, the, the pins that are still standing because oftentimes those students don't advocate. So trying to figure out who those pins that are still standing are can be challenging, but certainly it requires a lot of, um, in the moment. Yes, thanks for that, Sharon. So absolutely, um, it requires us to be observant and tentative to our students' needs. And so we'll also go over um, some ways where we can kind of get ahead of that by anticipating um, some of the challenges our students might be facing. And then Judy, um, would you mind coming off of mute? Yes, hi. Um, so, yeah, going off the point of, of uh, being able to identify those pins still standing, um, even after scaffolding, it still becomes more and more challenging if we think about the analogy of the ball. If you didn't get all, all the pins in one shot when you're trying to get one 
um, two different pins that are standing in opposite corners. And I look at that as two children that have completely different learning uh, abilities or, or learning styles, um, it becomes more challenging. Um, and so when we look at universal design, you know, it, it, it helps. For example, I teach kindergarten. So we already use so many um, visuals, so many hands-on, a lot of repetition, um, reteaching, and then having two adults in the classroom helps us to uh, better identify and be able to, um, to, 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 to help that ch those children meet their um, meet their, the expectations we have for them. So basically, that was, those were my thoughts. Great, thank you for that, Judy. And I'm so glad you lifted up um, universal design for learning. I will say we don't get so much into it today. It is a concept very closely connected to scaffolding, but um, I definitely encourage you if this is, if UDL is new to you to um, explore it more because it really does help us with understanding how to meet more needs um, and identifying students. Because as we know, with many children in one room meeting so many different needs is a challenge, but UDL and what we'll talk about with scaffolding is definitely um, one approach to begin to meet those needs. So thank you everyone for sharing that. Let's go ahead to the next um, slide, Tabitha, thank you. So our next question is, how do we identify or design strong scaffolds to accelerate learning? And so, thank you Tabitha. So what do we mean when we're saying strong instructional scaffolding? So what we go over today, it might feel a little bit different from how you're used to talking about scaffolds. Our goal today is to move beyond simply offering a discrete list of scaffolds and uh, instead move into thinking about um, the thinking that goes behind selecting or designing strong scaffolds for any content area. So what we mean when we're saying strong instructional scaffolds um, is that we consider uh, scaffolding as both a noun, so the scaffold as an observable thing, kind of like the items you see on the right hand side, and also a verb, so scaffolding as an intentional action uh, in the planning process and implementation. So let's first look at um, scaffolding as a noun. Uh, the table on your screen offers a simple definition um, and an explanation for these critical, for the critical features of the noun form of scaffold. So as it says there, it is a temporary student specific support structure designed to maximize access to grade level concepts and tasks. So let's unpack that a bit more. Let's go ahead and animate. Thank you. So when we talk about uh, a structure, we're thinking about scaffolds in their many different forms. So it might be an instructional tool like a graphic organizer, sentence frames, concept maps, visuals, realia. It might be a peer interaction. So commonly we have think pair share or um, peer to peer tutoring. Then we also have teacher interactions. So teachers who are um, assessing and advancing students thinking through their prompts and questions or providing feedback. And then a very typical one are exercises. So anything that we would fall under a routine, um, a self-evaluation, reflection, visualization, and so forth. Then we also know that the scaffold a student is provided with must be student specific. So it responds to evidence, not an assumption of an individualized need. Um, and it assets what the student has, or it takes advantage of a student's assets to provide a clear path to the learning. And then this third one, um, I would say is one of the most important features is remembering that scaffolds are meant to be temporary. So the sign of a strong scaffold is a scaffold that you are able to eventually remove um, from use. So the idea is that over time, um, the scaffold supports the student uh, with independently completing the task. So this doesn't mean that they'll no longer need scaffolds, but perhaps the scaffold will change or will evolve um, to get them to the point where they are independently learning or they're being able to use um, the scaffold or tool on their own as they see fit. Then we have grade level. So 
Again, the scaffold is meant to address grade level content so that it builds both competence and confidence for the student to attempt grade level work. And then finally, we have it should maximize access. So the purpose of an instructional scaffold is for students to maximize their time in that productive struggle with complex grade level content. So this means that we're minimizing what are anticipated student specific barriers to learning. So if we're thinking about um, earlier, uh, one of our colleagues mentioned English learners, if we are knowledgeable about our students uh, learn uh, language proficiency, we can anticipate what language demands are uh, should be minimized and which ones should be addressed. So all of this we're going to see goes back a lot to knowing and understanding your students. So I'll just pause here for a moment um, to let you all take another quick look to digest how we're talking about scaffolds when we're saying it in its noun form and what are the critical features of it. So before we move to the next slide, a quick question and either signal with a thumbs up or a plus one, how many people have received um, a file or a folder or some sort of packet of a bank of scaffolding strategies? Maybe it has graphic organizers or sentence prompts. Give us a thumbs up or a plus one if that's something maybe you have in your classroom right now or you've ever received. So depending on your content area, it seems this can be a very common experience where teachers, uh, we tend to amass these folders of different kinds of graphic organizers and folders with um, different types of scaffolds, kind of like the ones you see on this slide. And Unfortunately, we tend to stop here at the noun level when we're thinking about scaffolding, um, just as evidence and uh, fostered by the exhaustive uh, banks of scaffolding strategies that we see in the field today. Um, however, we continue to hear teachers say that they struggle with implementing strategies effectively or that the strategies just don't work. So um, we also continue to hear then requests for even more banks and examples of strategies specific to a particular curriculum or a particular group of students. And while these are undoubtedly helpful as a starting point when we're thinking about designing a scaffold, we have to remember that these um, lists of examples or banks of strategies by definition are limited in what they can offer in terms of improving our practice with scaffolding. So this brings us to our other definition or way of thinking about scaffolds. So in its verb form, we think of it as an intentional practice that takes into consideration three factors or three principles, the content, the student, and the context. Can we go ahead and animate those items? So this action-oriented definition, it necessitates a level of critical planning and reflection that's often lost when we're limiting our concept of instructional scaffolding to these discrete examples of what it looks like to engage students in using a certain strategy or a graphic organizer. So as you can see on your slide, we have um, a few questions uh, that help to define these three areas. So when we're thinking about content, that's of course um, the grade level understandings of expected of students um, to be able to learn and demonstrate. It also includes the prerequisite knowledge that's needed. So those are things you would consider when planning your scaffolds. Then of course, students. Um, we're thinking about uh, what an analysis of students' work and other data, whether quantitative or qualitative, what it specifically tells us about our students. And not just in the learning that they demonstrate, but what we know about um, who they are. 
And then also context. This has to do with the context in which you are teaching. So what resources are available to your environment? Earlier, um, we heard mention of a co-teacher or other specialists that help to collaborate. So what can we leverage in our context to scaffold students into grade level learning? So what we want to do is take our toolbox of scaffolds and apply them more intentionally. So how we do that requires uh, pedagogical content knowledge, a deep understanding of students, and reflective practices that attend to the interplay of these different, uh, these two factors and contextual factors. So rather than asking what's a good scaffold for this lesson or how do I scaffold X, we need to be asking ourselves more targeted questions uh, that get at the nuance of what we need to consider about content, student, and context. We're going to unpack this a little bit more on the next slide. So this table of um, how teachers can become better at designing and implementing scaffolds, it's not comprehensive, but I'd like for you to take one minute to look at the different considerations you must make when you're designing and implementing a scaffold. So if you could take a moment and chat one item that maybe um, stood out to you as something uh, you haven't maybe considered before when thinking about how you will scaffold for your students. Thanks for kicking us off, Doug. And seeing a lot about the role of culture coming out, clarifying the cognitive and linguistic demand. Great, so let's unpack um, a few of these. And of course, we would love more time to uh, unpack all of them, but we'll just highlight a few. So clarifying the cognitive and linguistic demand of the lesson. This is critical for all students, whether they are an uh, English learner or they are a native English speaker. Um, it's important because all students are developing academic language. The reason we wanna also clarify what the demands are is to ensure that we're not removing the rigor of the lesson. So I saw earlier one person mentioned um, that they a challenge they have is wondering if they're over scaffolding. Having a clear understanding of what the demands are and what students need to be able to produce um, in writing or orally, what they need to demonstrate, is critical to understanding if you are providing a scaffold that is giving them just the right amount of support or if it's potentially removing um, the rigor from the standard or the learning objective. The idea with scaffolds is that all students are working towards the same learning objective. Then we have study how students learn. So as a teacher, what do you know about how language develops um, and how students learn? Particularly uh, today, we talk a lot about the science of reading and how students um, process information. Uh, and it might be even specific to your content area. So informing yourself um, in that. Then recognizing the, cult, uh, the role that culture plays in learning. So the scaffolds that you um, choose should be informed by what you know about your students and their identity. Um, this might have to do with how students work together, how they express themselves, what assets and experiences are they coming with um, that come from their community, come from their family, and are not necessarily 
things that uh, they acquired or learned in the classroom. And so we want to think about how we can leverage those experiences. Uh, in a previous session, we talked about um, the importance of uh, building background knowledge or uh, fortifying background knowledge as a way of addressing unfinished learning. So it's important to think broadly about what your students are bringing to their classroom to help them make those connections that can scaffold them into grade level learning. And finally, when it comes to context, know when and who to ask for support. So I'm already seeing a lot of mention of co-teachers or the um, ESL specialist or ELD uh, coordinator or special ed teacher. It's really critical at this time uh, for students. It's always important, but particularly now that we're reaching out to our colleagues um, who have specialized expertise and um, reaching out for their support on how to best scaffold for our students. So we have one, uh, actually two questions there on the slide. Uh, let's go with, um, actually, we're only going to address the first one at this moment. So consider the current state of intellectual prep. Um, that's a, another way to just say lesson planning, um, your lesson planning process or the resources in your setting. And ask yourself, where do you have strengths in attending to these three dimensions? And let's go ahead and share some of those in the chat just to see what our colleagues are all coming with today. We really have a wide variety of skill sets when it comes to um, our strengths in this group with scaffolding. Uh, it is not an easy skill. It's a very dynamic skill, and we see different strengths in different areas. Great, so thank you all for sharing those. Keep those in mind as we transition in a few minutes to breakout groups um, where we're going to look at a video and uh, it'd be really great for your colleagues for you to lift um, those up and provide your insights when you go into group in the area that you feel strongest in. So right now we're going to transition to watching, um, a, doing an observation of a teacher. And uh, many of us have been talking about in the previous sessions about uh, equity and equal, equitable access to accelerated learning. So with equity as our goal, we really need to ensure that all students are given access to the rigorous educational experiences that they deserve and require. So scaffolding really helps us to achieve this goal. And so since we don't have our students of our own to plan for and observe right now, we're going to watch a video of an eighth grade science teacher who demonstrates and explains how he scaffolds his lessons for his class. And on the slide, there are a few questions that I'd like you to consider as you're watching the video. So what are the different ways that this teacher scaffolded and maintained rigor? So those specific scaffolds, so what did he use? or what did he do as a teacher action? Then what considerations when it comes to his content, his context, his students, do you think he made when choosing those specific scaffolds? So if he chose, let's say, for example, a word wall, what consideration do you think perhaps he made? And of course, we're doing some assumptions here, but the idea is to get our minds thinking in this way. And then finally, logistically, how did this teacher plan to meet the different needs of his class? So we talk about how we're often limited on time. So we wanna think about what did it take to plan this way? How was he efficient and effective? So consider these three questions. We'll put them in the chat um, as you're watching the video. And Margaret has just chatted the video link. You'll again be watching this one on your own. It's about um, six minutes long. So we will um, come back 
Um, let's see if we're able to open it quickly. Let's come back at about um, 4.02. or I'm sorry, 404, just in case we're take some time to open. And feel free again to go off video if you would like as you watch the video. Irene, I'm getting an error message saying technical difficulties when using the Vimeo. It says sign into Vimeo with your Google account. Let's try, there is a backup link if anyone else is having that issue. Um, if the Vimeo link didn't work for you, please try the YouTube link. Great, thank you. Welcome back everyone. We should be about done. It's okay if you still have a minute or two left um, on the video. It's pretty um, meaty with the examples. So uh, it's okay if you didn't make it to the end. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Tabitha. So right now we're going to go into breakout groups and you're gonna get an opportunity to talk about those three questions, the scaffolds you observed, the considerations you believe the teacher made and how you believe the teacher maintained um, the rigor of the lesson and learning objective. Uh, Tabitha, would you mind um, animating the slide? Great. So um, hopefully you were able to catch several of these. If not, before we go into breakout groups, take about 30 seconds. This is a bit of a cheat sheet of um, some of the scaffolds that you saw used in the video in case um, this is something new for you and it might have been challenging to catch some of these. So I believe it's in your version of the deck, but if not, just take a quick look. And I'm sure you'll gather more from your colleagues uh, as we transition to breakout groups, which we'll spend about um, five minutes in. And so Tabitha, whenever you're ready. Welcome back, everyone. We have about one minute to share out whole group. Um, we hope you were enjoying the rich discussions you were having in small group about the interplay of these um, different considerations that the teacher may have made. Uh, if you would like to share, um, if you could put your name in the chat, that would be great. And if there's something else you would like to share in the chat, please go ahead and do so. And I'm getting a message that Kathy uh, from Margaret's group might like to share. And if not Kathy, then perhaps Kyle. Yeah. I don't, I think, I don't know. I, I don't know if <laughs> that's what she's talking about. Um, <laughs> um, I think that I was in Margaret's group, but anyways, yeah, I, I noticed a lot of those things. I guess it was on the plus side that we're doing. Um, and one of the key things is you have to know your students. Um, you have to know what grade level. We do have mixed groups. So a lot of that stuff is what we are looking at with the pre-reading and the vocab and having the kids get together and they can even draw pictures as to what the words, because I'm taking it from a social studies perspective, where there's a lot of things they need to know, names, dates, everything, um, and become familiar with those concepts. We also do the reading first. I'll start them off with reading, I'll read the first paragraph, and then they have to stop, they have to think and come up with a question or something that they learn from it, or if they're still confused, because again, with our ESL students or any student with some of this more challenging text might not understand what they're reading. And then we break down from there and we do note taking, but my note taking is, um, I don't call it a notepad changer, but it's more scaffold. So in the beginning of the year, it's almost a word for word type text thing. And we take some of the words away and then it goes throughout the year, make it more challenging. So it gets to the point where it's paraphrase. Um, and then they have to be able to take information from there. Thanks so much, Kathy, for breaking all of that down. I think it's so important to hear the explanation you just shared to also understand that it is possible. We know it takes time, but we also know um, from what we talked about a little bit earlier, how important it is to um, be making these considerations and planning for scaffolds in this way. So um, thank you all for that. There's some great um, comments in the chat, but we're going to go ahead and move on to give you all one more example of how to um, use these consider excuse me, considerations. Thelma? 
Thank you, um, Irene. So if we can move on. Um, before making the decisions about the appropriate scaffolds, as, as my colleague has shared, you always have to consider content, context, and students. And so we're gonna start here in an example where we look at the content first. And remember that when we're talking about the content, we always wanna think about the targeted grade level standard and always start there. So we're gonna walk through this fourth grade example here just to model our thinking about what we would do. We see here that this fourth grade task aligns with 40A2. And we, when we analyze this particular task, we see that it connects with an understanding of multiplicative comparisons and that the students are having to actually use multiplic multiplicative comparisons to find perimeter. But the major goal of this standard here for grade level is not focusing on perimeter as much as it's focusing on multiplicative comparisons and additive comparisons. And so we see language here in the task that lets us know exactly what the grade level is. We also might think um, quickly about terms such as uh, measurement and length and width and multiplication connecting, but in the most important is we wanna to remember to connect with the targeted grade level standard here and focus on multiplicative comparisons. We can move on. So as we're thinking about this particular standard, we also wanna think about the appropriate prerequisite skills and the knowledge that's required for students to be able to access this learning. And in this particular case, we see that it is linked to a third grade standard, specifically 308A3. Um, you would be able to use the Desi Navigator as a tool for you to help you link to previous grade level standards. And we wanna make sure that we continue to focus on the primary goal of this particular standard, which is the multiplicative comparisons, not necessarily finding um, perimeter. And so as a teacher, we have to give careful attention to the coherence and the progression of the standard before we begin to plan our scaffold. So that we, now that we've identified the understandings that we need and what's coherently connected here, then the next thing that we want to also consider is the students in the context of the students. So let's look at an example here of how the student portion impacts it. This particular teacher for um, given this task collected particular data. She collected pre-assessment data she also collected data around daily activities, which could be determined as formative assessment data. And she used all of these, along with the knowledge of understanding what was omitted in the previous grade, as the teacher began to plan for the scaffold. So not only was she looking at the content, she was looking at the aspect of the student work. She wanted to know what the student work was telling her, so she had to collect multiple data points. And you want to be careful to do that. When we analyzed this particular data, the teacher was able to see that all of the students um, could uh, actually multiply and use multiplication with word problems for the third grade standard. However, only about 85, only about 15% of them were able to demonstrate and understand our perimeter, which means 85% of them struggled with understanding perimeter. So the area of concern here then becomes not just the multiplicative comparison now for the fourth grade, but also the language of um, perimeter, which is the third grade. So we see here that there's a struggle for the students around language and linguistics and the understanding that goes with that. So before we begin to even, before we begin to plan we still have to consider one more thing, and that's context. You always wanna consider the context for which you're beginning to teach. You wanna think about the resources that are available, the representations, the strategies that you will use um, in order to plan for those just-in-time scaffolds and provide the right scaffolds. So we wanna consider exactly what barriers were in place for this particular context. One, that was the fourth grade level content and also the barrier of language around vocabulary. These are things that could possibly impede the students being able to access this particular task. So as the teacher took a dip, deeper look and thought about the language and vocabulary, she had to be very intentional and careful about the scaffolds that she chose to make sure she was addressing 
teaching the multiplicative comparisons, along with addressing the barriers around language, and specifically when using language such as X times larger or X times longer, which is the fourth grade content. So let's quickly take a look at some examples of scaffolds. Before launching the task, this one teacher decided that they were gonna do a minute lesson for the whole class on calculating perimeter of a rectangle. Like many other teachers, um, the teacher believes that the students must show mastery of perimeter before they can move on and access the grade level co uh, concepts such as in the porch task. This is common, but remember this was the third grade lesson that she taught and the, the students seemingly understood it. But my wondering is, what are your thoughts? Enter into the chat box. Looking at this scaffold, do you think it's remediation or acceleration? I see several remediation, remediation, remediation. All these ACEs, absolutely, it's remediation. This is a common way um, to approach this, but remember that it is a third grade uh, lesson that she did, did. Though she was well intended in what she did, it halted the current grade level instruction and it implicitly sent the message that finding perimeter is a separate and isolated skill and it wasn't coherently connected to what the students were working on. We want to remember that when we're accelerating students' understanding, we always want them to see and experience connections through coherent lessons and make sure that they understand what they're doing. More importantly, we also have to keep in mind what the actual goal of the targeted standard would be. Let's look at another example. In this example, the teacher decided to provide the students with a tape diagram to help them make sense of the word problem. What are your thoughts? Do you think that this is an effective um, scaffold? If you are entering to the chat box, whether you think it's effective or not, simply with a yes or a no. Thank you all, Sarah, Doug, Elizabeth, Kyle. Several people are saying no. You are absolutely on point. This is not the most effective scaffold for the context of this particular uh, problem. The tape diagram did help the students to get the right answer, but by giving them a pre-made one, the teacher was lowering the cognitive demand that was needed to access the grade level task. She took away the opportunity for them to grapple with the thinking and make sense of the multiplicative aspect of the task. Now, we want to clearly um, pause here and say that we're not saying that tape diagrams are not effective scaffolds. We're just saying for this particular context, it wasn't the most effective because it did not minimize our barrier, which was vocabulary and language. A better approach would have been for the teacher to give them a blank um, tape diagram and let them choose. So let's look at this final example here. In this last example, we see that the teacher gave them a vocabulary um, visual and she also placed it on the word wall. So again, in the chat box, tell us if you think that this was an effective way to address the barrier that we have, simply by entering a yes or no. I see a lot of yeses here. Absolutely, great. Because of the context of this particular situation, when she considered the students, the context and the content, giving them a visual representation that addressed the scaffold of vocabulary was the most effective strategy here. Additionally, this teacher, which is not necessarily noted, but this teacher also was very careful in her um, grade level lessons to use the multiplicative language of X being smaller or X being so many times larger or smaller. So absolutely, visual models are absolutely important. I know that that was um, rather quick to move through the math example, but you were able very easily in your responses to respond to and, and notice the importance of the content, the context in the students. So let's pause here. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Let's pause here and give you an opportunity to reflect on what you've experienced.
experience today and just select one of the three questions you see here to respond to in your note catcher. And as you begin to close out on your thoughts and your learning for today, we want to invite you to be sure that you complete the survey uh, from our session today. The survey has been linked in the chat box. We sincerely thank you for all the great work that you have engaged in today as we go back and reflect. Let's look um, quickly here at our information and see if we actually hit our learning targets. Did we have an opportunity to learn about acceleration and support diverse needs? Absolutely. Were we proactively looking at planning for strategies um, to address learning acceleration? Absolutely. And did we anticipate and plan for potential barriers? So thank you so much. Um, as you close, if you will identify the, the objective that really stuck with you today, and complete the uh, survey. I want to remind you that the recordings are not yet posted, but you do have access to the note catcher and they will be posted later. Thank you all so much for your attention and your time. Enjoy the remainder of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. We'll stay on for another two minutes just to answer any individual questions that anybody has. Otherwise, you can hop off. Please go ahead and complete our survey. We really love to read your feedback. Um, we are always reading it right after the session and wondering how we can improve for the next session. So please, please, please go ahead and fill out that survey. And have a great afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow.